Okay, so Aaron Owens, we're so glad to have you here with us today. Aaron is the Access Services Coordinator at Sam Houston State University, and she's just gotten to uh, promoted to full professor. Congratulations with tenure in the Newton Grace, Gresham 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 Gresham. Okay, library at Sam Houston State University, where she has supported an array of public service roles since 2007. As the scholarly communications librarian, she currently supports researchers from students to faculty with numerous stages of scholarly communication uh, of the scholarly communication cycle from research data management, planning through publication and beyond. She's also the coordinator for access and interlibrary services. In this role, she directly supervises two staff managers and coordinates the work of eight full-time staff members and approximately 25 student workers in circulation reserves billing, stacks maintenance, copy services, and interlibrary loan. You sound pretty busy. Erin received her master's of science degree in library science from the University of North Texas in 2006, and we are so happy to have her here today. Welcome, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. And before we get started, I wanted to remind you all that the, um, the, the interview will be recorded. So if you don't care to have your camera on, just go ahead and leave it off. And also, would you please put your questions as we progress in the chat, and we will get to your questions at the end of the interview. All right, so let's get started. Um, I would recommend to everyone that you change your view, if you don't mind, to speaker view. That way it's like a interview format and you're watching two people talk on a sofa. All right. So um, Aaron, you've been with Sam Houston State University in a variety of roles, as I just mentioned, since 2007. For those, for those of us unfamiliar, can you give us some facts about Sam Houston State University and the Newton Gresham Library related to the location, size, student body, and rankings, research focus, or any other statistics you think are important? Sure. Um, so SHSU is located in Huntsville, Texas, which is about an hour north of Houston, if that's familiar in location. Um, we were actually founded in 1879 as a normal institute for teacher training. And so we've always had a very strong focus on preparing professional teachers and also on being a teaching focused institution. Um, we've really grown steadily over time. Last year, our Carnegie classification was actually increased. Um, we had been a doctoral professional university for many years. We're now classified as a doctoral university with high research activity, which is more colloquially an R2 institution. Um, we've got about, about 20 to 21,000 students at both undergraduate and graduate levels across eight colleges. And um, we offer about 11 different doctoral degrees, just to give you a sense of our graduate level activity. Um, we're known for having very competitive tuition rates, even in a state like Texas, where out-of-state tuition is already pretty competitive. Um, we were recently designated as a Hispanic-serving institution. Um, we've ranked this past year, we ranked best in Texas for social mobility, which is one of the things we're really taking a lot of pride in um, helping our students actually be able to kind of move up the socioeconomic ladder. And we're very consistently recognized for supporting and graduating first generation college students. That's one of our areas, areas of emphasis. Well, congratulations. Those are a lot of great achievements. And it sounds like we have a lot in common because a lot of the things that you mentioned are also happening here at the University of North Texas. I have to put a plug in there after letting you plug Sam Houston State University. Okay. Um, you, you've had so many roles in your time at Sam Houston State University, right? Reference librarian, web services librarian, and now access services coordinator and scholarly, scholarly communications librarian. Can you speak to each of these positions as to what the daily work looked like and which skills were most important to help you accomplish these goals in these positions? Yeah, definitely. Um, I started out as a reference librarian, which I have to admit was not very expected for me. Um, when I went through my UNT program, I specialized in information organization and I wanted to go into cataloging, but all of the cataloging postings required past experience and the reference librarian positions were entry level. <laughs> So I took a reference position just as a, a way to get started, but ended up absolutely loving it, would not have wanted to land anywhere else. Um, I came in as the liaison to history and foreign language departments. Um, so in that role, I was responsible for maintaining the subject collections in those areas. So that included 
purchasing new materials, discarding old materials, kind of keeping our collection up to date, making sure it matched what the department was going to be teaching. Um, for history in particular, that involved managing an annual budget of about $30,000. So it was um, that was a really neat opportunity to get to decide how to spend that money. I was also then responsible for meeting with students and faculty in those subject areas and providing individual research consultations, just helping them work through questions about where to find the things they were looking for. Um, I taught information literacy sessions for classes um, and then developed instructional materials, videos, things like that. Uh, covered regular shifts at the reference desk, just doing uh, basic walk-up reference support, and virtual reference. Um, so that, that role really, really called on me to use the core skills I learned in my graduate program, using the reference interviews, uh, the searching skills that I learned, definitely called on those core reference courses that I took. Um, I found that it also really required excellent verbal and written communication skills, just to be able to communicate with so many different audiences, with undergrad, grad, faculty, um, who all wanted to communicate in so many different ways, whether that was in-person, email, virtual chat, and I am. Um, so really trying to figure out how you manage all that different kind of communication to achieve different goals. Um, now, just about the time that I was hired in that reference role, there was another reference librarian who had been managing the website, and she was moving on to a different institution. She actually left us and took a job at UNT. <laughs> Um, but uh, I had a little bit of past website experience, so the website was kind of given to me as a side project because the timing worked out. So over a couple of years, I was gradually working to try to improve our website, um, implement new tools like LibGuides. Um, I oversaw our transition to a new virtual chat program. I created our first social media channels, so I really kind of just got excited about doing some things that weren't necessarily required, but were interesting. Um, and so that after a couple of years, my director decided to officially give me a title of web services librarian. Um, she decreased some of my reference and instruction duties so that I had more time for web services, but I was still the history liaison. So I was still kind of juggling um, two big jobs. Um, I found that I needed a lot more technical skills in the web services role, but I was really the only person in the department doing that kind of work. So gaining those skills became more challenging. It really took a lot of initiative, a lot of self-motivation to figure out what I wanted to learn and go out and figure out how best to learn that. Um, while I was in that web services role, then I started becoming more exposed to some of our databases that I maybe hadn't used before um, and some other online tools that were new to me. So I started learning things like um, Cabell's Scholarly Analytics and learning about Google Scholar profiles and ORCID and OpenStax and kind of all of these other um, online tools floating out there. And that kind of led me off on this sidetrack of learning about OER and scholarly publishing and research metrics just because I discovered these tools. So I started just independently building my knowledge in that direction. I hit on some topics that I found really interesting, like choosing what journal you're going to send a paper to, which interested me as a researcher myself. Um, and so I just independently started developing some training materials going in that direction because of my own interest. Um, at that point, a we had a retirement in our department at a department head level. So it was an opportunity to move up the hierarchy in our library is pretty minimal. We, we're a very flat structure, so there's not a lot of opportunity to move up structurally. Um, so this was kind of a rare opportunity to move over to the access services department, but be able to take on a management and supervision role. And I, um, my, my director invited me to take that opportunity and I accepted it because I wanted that chance to, to move up and learn some new management skills. Um, so she wrote scholarly communications into that job description because she'd seen I was moving in that direction and she was recognizing that there was definitely a need for us to have more of that kind of support. Um, so that became part of my job as, as the access services coordinator. Um, it still took me a couple of years after that promotion to give away my history 
liaison duties. So that was still juggling a lot of different hats for a while. Um, after I was able to give away my support for the history department, which I was sad to do, I really enjoyed doing that. But once I gave that up, I really had the opportunity to throw myself more into the research support. Um, this role, again, really calls on communication skills, determining the best way to take a complex topic, break it down, and make it accessible to researchers at very different levels of knowledge. Okay, well, that that all sounds amazing. And by the way, at the beginning, you mentioned that you had originally wanted to go into cataloging, and and then and then you took this you know reference position, and it it reminded me of something that I've been told by numerous um, librarians is that just get into the library. You you don't your first position doesn't have to be the one that you actually want because once you get in you know, look at all the opportunities that came your way afterwards. Exactly. I, I definitely agree with that statement. Um, you get in the door, you start learning how the libraries really work on the ground. Um, and then often opportunities will present themselves or you work to create them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, so these days you engage in a lot of research support, right? Uh, what kind of training and expertise did you acquire to be successful in this role? And what does the work actually entail day to day? Sure. Um, I, I really sought out training. I Again, it was one of those things where we're, we were a fairly small library. We still are. Um, and no one else here was really working in this space. So I had to really seek out what kind of training was available and figure out what would be useful. Um, definitely leveraging things like the ACRL Scholarly Communications Toolkit. That helped me get a sense of what what is this very broad umbrella that is called scholarly communications and and how do these different topics underneath that work um i attended a number of the acrl road shows in scholarly communications um i attended an in-depth bibliometrics and research evaluation workshop that was taught by leiden university they're um kind of a leader in the the bibliometric space i also spent a lot of time just reading just finding books, reading, teaching myself. Um, there's a, a, a book titled Scholarly Metrics by Cronin and Sugimoto. I actually borrowed that one from my library, started reading it. And after a couple of weeks, I had so many colored sticky flags sticking up between all the pages that I ended up just buying my own copy so I could write notes in the margin. <laughs> um, but I would definitely say one of the things about training and expertise in this area is that things move so fast. Things are constantly changing. New things are coming out. Um, even, even just this January, um, new rules from the National Institute of Health went into effect for data sharing plans that researchers have to submit. And so that was one of those new topics that came up that librarians who support this area had to train themselves very quickly and be prepared to then train their researchers. Um, so it really, I've really found that I have to remain adaptable mm. and I have to stay very connected to the news and the trends and, and figure out what new things are on the horizon that I'm gonna need to be prepared to discuss with my patrons. So um, listening to you talk about this helps me understand that you're basically giving advice. Like what did you do and how did you manage this? But for a current Master's of Library Science student, mm -hmm. what, what do you think would be the most important takeaway from advice that you're giving now if they're interested in getting into this kind of work? Yeah, I, I'd say just start by, by following some channels that you can listen and read and understand kind of what's, what's happening. Um, you know, find a few blogs or listservs. Um, ACRL on the ALA Connect site, ACRL has a scholarly communication discussion group which is one great thing to follow. And then things like the Scholarly Kitchen blog that covers scholarly publishing. Um, couple of, just pick a couple of channels like that. You don't have to overwhelm yourself, but a couple of places where you can start reading and absorbing the current issues and becoming part of the conversation, um, build up that networking. Um, anytime they reference a concept or a tool that you don't know about, look it up, do some research, and, and that'll help you to start deepening your knowledge kind of across the area. Okay, great. Um, so I remember when I was a student in the master's program here at UNT, 
And uh, I was asked to go over to the library and search for um, examples of Punjabi, the language Punjabi. I had no idea what that was. Uh, we, we had a snowstorm. Well, the, the class only met on one day a week and we were closed on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And then, so we didn't have the class that night. And then we had a snowstorm. So we missed the next Monday. So the professor basically just said, here, you need to get started on this project. Go, go get started. I would have loved to be able to walk into the library and find you. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not what happened. I don't you as a student, I'm not sure I even knew at that time what options I had. So in your case now, what are the greatest needs you encounter among student researchers? Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I feel like we spend a lot of time focusing on the tools, like showing them how to use the tools. But in many cases, I think they're better at figuring that part out themselves when they have to. Um, so for us, it's it's a lot more understanding the concepts. Um, they don't handle as many physical books and journals anymore. So even just understanding what's the difference between the content that you find in a book and the content that you find in a journal article and how do you distinguish between those kinds of sources. Um, and then the students that I work with in, in the SCALCOM role, you know, maybe they're just getting started um, supporting research, working on a project with a faculty member, and they need a better understanding of things like, what is data? What do we really mean when we talk about collecting data? And um, how do we collect and manage that in consistent and accurate ways? So, so really kind of focusing on that conceptual level, but figuring out how to meet them where they're at, and then help them move, move forward from there. Has have, have the needs changed over time or since the pandemic? Or in the case of UNT, we have so many international students now. You are, and we're so thankful that our international student population is growing. But do you find different needs among different groups and because of the changes in our society? Yeah. Yeah, to some extent, um, I think we already were doing so much distance education here that I don't know if we noticed quite as big of a change from the pandemic. Um, we were already having to very robustly support remote students studying from different states, different countries. Um, so I'm not sure we've noticed as many changes in that respect, but but definitely just familiarity levels with um, with research objects. Like I said, like things like the difference between a book and an article, stuff like that has definitely changed significantly in the 15 years that I've been here. Just um, just working with students who have come in so much more embedded in the digital world that the questions they ask are just um, differently slanted than the students that maybe had more grounding in the physical research world. I see. And how about helping professors? What's what's the difference between helping professors with their research needs and helping students with their research needs? Are they similar, different? You know, they can be more similar than you might expect, <laughs> but they can be very different. Um, I think when, when we work with the professors, we, we have to find this space where we acknowledge that they are the experts in their field. They are the ones who are the expert in chemistry or zoology or whatever it is that they study. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are experts in everything about the research process or new research tools, things like that. Um, so finding a way to balance our respect for their expertise while also being able to help them learn something new, um, can be an interesting line to walk. They don't, sometimes they don't realize that there are so many aspects of research that they maybe aren't familiar with yet. They, they learned how to do it a particular way. They're not aware of newer procedures or newer tools. Um, so it, it can be a little different kind of dancing around the subject with them. To, <laughs> Yeah, the students absolutely give you the authority that you have earned, and perhaps the professors need to be reminded that you, and, and now you're a full professor. Yeah. Congrats again. So do you think that this, this has an effect on your ability to engage with the faculty? Hope so. I hope so. Um, I mean, I think our librarians having faculty status, which isn't true at every university, but mm -hmm. um, I think having that status can help to to kind of emphasize to faculty that we are their peers, that we go through the same um, 
research and publishing and service, the same kinds of things that they do in their roles. So we understand where they're at. We can we can relate. Um, and I think it does help them recognize our authority, um, especially getting to the full professor level. Um, it gives us access to certain committees and spaces on campus mm -hmm. that we haven't had access to before that are only open to full professors. And so I do think it helps bring visibility to librarians as faculty in a, in a different way. Yes, and that actually proves true. I've spoke with the director of, the, of libraries um, recently. He's also an alum. And he mentioned that if you get the faculty and the deans behind you, then the library is going to be a supported place, much yeah. more supported than if you don't have them on your side or not, not on your side, but they, they should see it as their number two priority after their colleges and <laughs> such. Okay. And then um, what was the process like of attaining this goal of reaching the goal of professor, full professor? Sure. Um, so, you know, we, we start out trying to work towards tenure and in many ways, it's the same process continuing. So we have six years at my university, it's six years working towards tenure. Um, you have to be producing a consistent record of publications, demonstrating a consistent record of service on committees. And then of course, just consistent excellence in your performance of librarianship, performing your job duties. Um, in many cases, by the time you get through that six years, you're pretty exhausted and you kind of wanna just rest and take some time off from doing those things. But to work towards that next level of promotion, it's just keeping that up. It's showing that um, that we can continue to publish at that rate. And then also showing a higher level of um, leadership and mentorship within the field, getting involved in activities that, that really helps to establish us as knowledgeable experts and demonstrate our willingness to help share our expertise with others in the field. Okay, great, thank you. So your undergraduate degree was classical studies. I wonder what sparked your interest in going for a master's of science and library science at UNT. And can you tell us what helped you decide that this would be your career path? Sure, that's always a fun one. Um, I, I studied Latin all through high school, all through college. I majored in classical studies and I was absolutely convinced that I wanted to be a Latin teacher. That, that was my goal. Um, senior year of college, I took an education course that was supposed to prepare us for teaching and we had to go do classroom observation hours. So I spent about 80 hours observing the high school Latin classes in my district. And I very quickly realized I was not going to be able to cope with teaching high school students every day. Um, I just suddenly hit this wall and said, this, this is not going to suit me. So then I was finishing my degree and graduating and frantically trying to decide what was gonna come next. Um, my grandmother had been a librarian. She worked in public libraries, academic libraries, corporate libraries for about 40, 50 years. And she had spent most of my life telling me, you should think about being a librarian. You would be a great librarian. And I kept telling her it sounded like the most boring thing I could imagine. Uh, kept kind of brushing it off. So here I am finishing college, trying to figure out what's next. I had been working summer jobs with a software company that ended up hiring me on after graduation. And I spent about a year doing database development with this software company and trying to figure out what was next. And my grandmother came back to me again about being a librarian. And I finally said, oh my gosh, what, you know, what on earth do you think is so exciting about this? And she said, well, you come into work every day and you wait for someone to bring you a puzzle. And you have no idea what they're going to ask you, but it's going to be some puzzle that you get to solve. And I started thinking about that in terms of the software work I was doing. And I said, you know, that's actually what I love about database development is that my boss will come to me and say, can you make the software do X, Y, Z? And I'll be stuck going, well, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. And it's that same puzzle solving, problem solving. Um, and so once I got it put into those terms, I became more curious about it. And I started um, reaching out and having conversations with professional librarians in different, different contexts um, and did an interview with one of the professors at UNT and decided, you know, okay, grandma's right. I'm interested in this. <laughs> That's great. We should all remember that our grandparents have a lot of good information to share with us and our parents too. <laughs> 
Um, you know, it, we seem to be, we have a lot in common because I had that exact same experience. I was going to be a Spanish teacher in mm -hmm. high school. That was my plan. And I had the exact same epiphany when I got into the classroom and started teaching and thought, oh, I have no uh, classroom management skills and these, these students are going to eat me alive. And they did. So um, yeah, I also went back for a master's degree in order to teach at the college level, which worked out fine. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's funny because in, in some ways the undergraduates aren't that far removed from mm -hmm. high school students. It's a similar age group, but just not having to be in the classroom every day teaching the same content over and over again, it, it made all the difference that I can interact with them in a different way. Um, I love the fact that I'm not necessarily the one who's responsible for their for grading them. Um, so I can be more like their ally as their librarian rather than. Their and librarians are teachers, right? But like you said, you're not fully responsible for all the the learning. Right. You get to, you get to help with the pieces. Right. I feel like it takes and the puzzles. That, right. It takes away some of the intimidation that, hey, I'm not here to grade you. I'm just here to help you. <laughs> exactly. OK, let's go on to the next one. Um, so I see that recently you started taking some history courses. Yes. Uh, how does this area of study help in your role as a librarian or is it just a hobby? Um, so it was actually something something I did a little bit earlier in my career while I was while I was supporting the history department. Um, I was thinking about working towards a second master's in history, um, partly just to better support that department and honestly, partly to get more buy in from some of those faculty, because I would periodically talk to faculty members try to convince them of what I could do to help their students. But I would get this hesitation from some of them that said, well, you're not a historian. You know, how can you help us? You're not a historian. And recognizing that it's not necessarily my job to be the historian, to be the expert in interpreting history. It's my job to be the expert in research. But um, I decided that taking some graduate work at that level would help to boost my credibility a little bit in that capacity. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't ever actually end up finishing that second master's, but at least accumulating 12 hours of that graduate credit, you know, that's about what they require from their adjuncts. So I felt like that gave me that credibility of, okay, I at least know enough in your, at your historian level that I can balance this out and you can, you can trust me to help. <laughs> I see. And would you advise that to any librarian working in that capacity that you were, the role that you were in at that time? Do you think that's useful? Um, I do, and I know some institutions have more requirements for their librarians to have a second master's degree or graduate work in a subject area. Um, we don't require it at this time, but a lot of our librarians do have at least that little bit of a foundation of graduate work. So I do think it um, it can give you some more options and make you stand out a little bit more if you're um, if you're trying to get into a subject librarian kind of role. Okay. And you are very well published and a prolific presenter, uh, according to your resume. Is this, the kind of, is this the kind of work that's required in your position? Or does the work that you do kind of organically lead to finding information that's worth publishing, worth presenting, and what you're wanting to share it with others? Sure. So at my institution, it is definitely required um, as tenure track faculty. That's part of our requirements to be performing scholarly activities, whether that's publishing, presenting, kind of a mix of those. Um, so initially, I guess it started out as just, this is something I have to be able to do. Um, I ended up really, really enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, I have loved the process of conducting original research and publishing. Um, I try to tie a lot of it to my day-to-day -day work. Um, when I was working in reference and in web services, both, I was really interested in thinking about the technology, the, the technological tools that our library uses for patrons, whether that's things like our virtual chat service or even just the databases that we subscribe to. I really wanted to understand how our patrons used those and how they felt about them, kind of what that user experience was like. So I've done a lot of my work in that area, um, doing usability testing and user surveys and trying to get a better understanding of where these tools work well for our users and where they're not working as well as they could. And then trying to communicate that information back out in a way that hopefully is helpful to the field in um, improving the tools that we use. 
I see. So it seems like maybe you, you like to create a little puzzle for yourself and then go <laughs> and, and look for the answers to your own puzzle. And then that, that ends up being research and uh, publishable research and presentations. Great. Yeah. Now, I'm particularly interested in a recent grant that you've been awarded to compile resources for parents with disabilities. Can you tell us how you became interested in this work and give an update on your progress? Sure, sure. Um, this, this was one where I think the opportunity ended up driving me to the topic rather than having a topic in mind and finding an opportunity. But um, I had seen advertisements for the Carnegie Whitney grant through ACRL, um, which gives money to create like bibliographies basically on, on a topic. And I had thought it just sounded like a neat opportunity. Said, hey, that's that's something I could build. What what could I think of to build it about that we could get some funding? And I spent a lot of time bouncing around different ideas that were almost there, but not quite. Um, and then one day I kind of had some, some personal experiences. So my partner is a disabled veteran. Um, he had he broke his back when he was in military service and we have a very small child and we've faced a lot of challenges with how his disability impacts his ability to engage as a parent you know you get a small kid they want you to toss him up in the air and swing him around like an airplane and that's not something that a person with a broken back can do um so as as we were struggling with some of these little incidents at home I really got to thinking about that as a topic and thinking, you know, when you're already stressed out parenting a small child, you're busy trying to go out and figure out where there are resources that can help you and your kids to manage this experience can be challenging. So that was just how I suddenly landed on, hey, this is an idea that I could submit for that grant, that I have the the knowledge as a parent and, and the knowledge as the spouse of a um, person with a disability to help compile a bibliography of resources. Um, so some of it is, some of it's kind of self-help how-to strategies. Some of it is more like memoirs and personal experiences. So helping people to just connect and realize that they may not, they're not the only ones who is experiencing these challenges. Um, and then part of it is children's books that are targeted at helping your children to understand um, the impact of their parents' disability and how that may look different than other people's parents. Um, I'm trying to finish it up this spring. I I hired a wonderful graduate student last summer. That was what I used the grant funding for, was to hire a wonderful graduate student to help me um, compile resources and evaluate them. And I'm hoping to get it published online later this uh, spring semester. What a great opportunity for that graduate student. Uh, you know, it's they're they're so lucky at at any university where the the librarians, the professors, go for these grants and then are able to have funding to pay graduate students to do work and get experience. Definitely, yeah. And um, just as in addition, I I found your story fascinating, and it must have been kind of a labor of love as well as you worked toward finding all the information. Very much so, very much so. Always, always one half of my eye on books that I want to get for my family as well. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay. Um, it appears you've been engaged in research on a variety of topics. And what are your main research interests and why? Um, so as I said a moment ago, my I, a lot of my research has really centered on the user experience with library technology and how we can improve that technology for a better library experience. That's where a lot of my work is focused. Um, as my role has shifted more towards scholarly communications, I'm developing more research interests in that area. But I think a lot of it for me is still very user focused of wanting to understand what users need in terms of research support services and how the library can best deliver uh, deliver what they need and best meet those needs. So I think my research interests have always been very, very user focused. Okay, and um, since you research a lot for yourself for your own topics, what? How do you think that has impacted you on your with your ability to help students and professors in their research? Can you give some examples? Yeah, I I think it's absolutely crucial to be honest. Um, for any for anyone who wants to work in academic libraries, helping others in like research planning and research publishing and things like that, I think it's really essential to have been through the process yourself. 
It means that you know the journey that they're on. So when they hit a particular point where they need guidance, you know from your own experience, not just from what you've read. Um, but you can really talk them through, hey, you know, this is what you need to put in your data management plan. Um, and you can project the confidence that comes from being there and doing it yourself. Um, one of the papers that I published in either 21 or 22, I can't remember it, where it came out, but one of the papers I published recently was a study of feelings of imposter syndrome among scholarly communication librarians and looking at kind of correlation of different skills and experiences to confidence levels. Um, it, it, the data really showed that people who had published themselves, who had done their own original research and published it, had far more confidence and far less feelings of imposter syndrome in supporting other researchers. So I think it's a really essential um, tool to help us understand what they're going through and be able to give them the right support. Yeah, that makes sense. It makes absolute sense. So we're coming up on our last questions. So the people in the audience, if you'd like to start compiling your questions and putting them in the chat, we'll get to those after I ask Erin her last question. Um, okay, so finally, what specific courses or skills did you get from your time at UNT? So this is a little UNT shout out, right, which you mentioned a little bit already um, that prepared you for your, your job in the library, your first, your second, your third, your fourth, your many hats in the library. Um, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, shout out to my, to my core reference course, because um, since I thought I wanted to go into cataloging and work more on the back side than, than work on the front patron facing side. I don't honestly know if I would have chosen to take the reference course if it had been a choice, but I'm so glad that it was a required piece of that core curriculum um, because I did learn so much about how to talk to the users and kind of figure out what is it you really need? What is the actual need behind the question that you're phrasing? Um, and then how to recognize what kind of a source is gonna be the right place to go dig and help them find that answer. Um, I did also take several like more technology related courses in web development and um, metadata and things like that, that, that I definitely think were also important as I started getting into some of my other roles beyond just basic reference. Um, and, and then what advice would you give current students um, about how to prepare for those entry level job? interviews yeah do you interview people these days yes okay so so let's say one of our students has graduated and they're or getting ready to graduate and they come to you to interview for an opening you have in the library do you have some good advice for them yeah definitely um so i think as in, in whatever context you can give specific examples of something you've done if, even if it's like, well, I did a class project that touched on this, it maybe isn't professional experience, but it helps us to at least get a small window into some way that you've touched on this topic. Um, when there's something that you have not had an opportunity to work with yet, but something that you're interested in, um, try to tell us, like, instead of just saying, well, I haven't had an opportunity to do that. Try to tell us what you would be interested in or what you what you would envision doing um, in a particular area. Um, help us see the potential, even if you don't have the, the actual grounded experience yet. Um, and I had another one on the tip of my tongue that I just lost. Um, Well, let me tell you an experience that we had with a, a maybe it'll, maybe I'll, yes, I'll, jog, I'll jog, maybe you'll jog my memory because I just blinked. <laughs> no, I'm in, I'm in the same boat with you. This happens to me all the time. So mm -hmm. we, we interviewed a, a public school librarian um, in, uh, at the beginning of the code series. And she does interviews also for hiring new librarians there. And she said that the, the most important thing to her was that if she asks, why do you want to be a librarian? She doesn't want to hear, I like books. I love books. <laughs> Uh, so I was a little shocked to hear her say that because, you know, to me that she just said, that's an obvious answer. So you need to, you know, it's not enough. You're not going right. to just corner and read books. <laughs> um, and right. and right. I see one of our, one of our participants, one of our audience members also loves books. I think we all love books, right? 
Exactly. I think we all love books, but you're right. I mean, every once in a while we have someone who says, oh, well, you know, I just love reading. So I want to work in the library. And it, it does make us wonder if they really understand what the job entails, because, you know, we definitely don't get to just sit at our desk with our feet up and read books. All day. Darn. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think other things in the interview. Um, I think for me, for me, the traits that I most want to see come through in the interview answers are um, curiosity and initiative. So even if someone doesn't have a lot of experience yet doing something, I want to see that they have the curiosity to be able to learn what they need to learn mm -hmm. and the initiative to take whatever steps are necessary. Um, that, that kind of reassures me that they can learn how to do anything they haven't done yet if they can display those. And then I think that curiosity is also just the skill needed to be a good librarian that um, it's got to reach some point where it's not just that my patron has asked me this question, but now I am totally invested in finding the answer and knowing that I can solve that puzzle. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Well, we do have a few questions that have popped into the chat. So let me get over there. I'm going to start with um, Gabriel Lopez. He was the first one to arrive in the <laughs> audience. So um, this question is, I am a first year research and instruction librarian. Oh, congratulations. What, what piece of advice would you have loved to hear in your first year? Um, you know, I think, I think what I really, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I think what I would have loved to hear in my first year of, of doing instruction in particular, it is that idea of focusing on the concepts rather than the tools or the technology. Um, I think like a lot of people, I started out doing classes that were more about where do you click? You know, where do you click in a database to do a search and filter your results? Um, and then I had one instruction session where we had a total technology failure. The computer wouldn't come on, the screen wouldn't come on. And I'm in front of this people's classroom trying to figure out how do I do a library instruction session without any of this technology? And I resorted to an old school whiteboard and dry erase marker. And I found myself breaking it down into concepts that would apply in any interface. And it actually ended up being one of my favorite instruction sessions that I've ever done. Um, and that really- Can you give me... an example of one of those concepts? I'm just, I'm- Sure, I'm able right. to put so, my finger on what you mean yeah. by that. So, so like when we talk about brainstorming search terms okay. and how we're going to put the search terms together with Boolean operators and things like that, being able to do that agnostic of a particular interface so that the students aren't getting overly focused on what the buttons look like, but that mm -hmm. we're really focusing on the words and making connections between ideas. Um, doing that separately from the interface actually felt to me like it helped. And it kind of changed the way that I thought about coming in with chart paper on an easel and doing brainstorming things there separate before we ever get into an interface and talking to them about, you know, before you ever search, let's think about what it is we're going to search for and how we're going to search. Um, that makes sense. I, I get it now. And I'm I'm the worst about being thinking, oh, I need to find an article on X, Y, Z. And I just jump into that interface and then I look at the boxes and I think, um, okay, what are my keywords? Uh, I haven't thought about this yet, but I got to put something in here and get started. <laughs> so yeah, planning before you go towards the tools. Yeah. yeah. And I think the more that the more that we've done it, the more experienced we get at research, the more we can do that on the fly. But for a lot of our undergraduates who haven't had to think about it before, um, just stopping and taking a pencil and focusing on that step first, I think can give them more success once they finally do start typing things. And yes, and the follow-up is that um, the student says, or I guess worker now, says, thank you for this. I just had a session this week and felt going through the tech was not very effective. So that'll give you some other ways to, to do it. Um, and then we have another question. Uh, in the next five years, how might the user inter experience in libraries evolve or change? Oh, that's such a good question. I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I had that crystal ball. Um, because we do we do see it evolving so much. Um, we've we just recently, so my library uses EBSCO Discovery Service as our kind of combined search layer for our databases. And we're just now piloting the new interface that they're going to be pushing on us. And it's very drastically different. Um, much more of a move towards this very simplified 
I don't want to say Google-like, I hate saying that, but that simplified Google-like interface, um, really streamlining the user experience, which I think is going to be challenging on some level for us as librarians when we're we're used to wanting to dig into the advanced tools, the power mm -hmm. subject tools, and we're used to wanting to teach our students how to use those. But on some level, especially as the algorithms, predictive algorithms get better, um, we may have to kind of pull back a little bit from all of those power searching tools. Um, but you know, also seeing everything that's happened in the past couple of months with chat GPT and the, the generative AI, um, the, the, the AI chat being integrated into Microsoft's Bing search engine. I mean, some of this stuff is really making me wonder what, what kind of a precipice we're on of how that may end up becoming more integrated into our search tools um, and, and our research interfaces. So I don't know. I feel like the next five years could, could show a lot of change and I don't know what all that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, on the other hand, the 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 Google image, the the Google like image, may be less intimidating to students when they first start doing their research. I know that yep. my students in the past would always seem so intimidated by that that those boxes and the yep. and or and everything. <laughs> too many too many options. Too many options. Yes. Okay, we have another question. This one comes from Mimi. Mimi asks, "Did the fact that librarians? Oh, sorry. Did the fact librarians at SHSU have faculty status?" affect your decision to choose it as your first job. Okay, I see. Did the fact that they have that uh, and what in what ways? Yeah, um, for me, I would say it did not. I, I was sort of in a unique situation that I was looking to live and work in a certain geographical area. And so I was pretty much willing to take a job regardless of that. Um, I think when I started out, I did not have a very good understanding of what faculty status and tenure, I really didn't have a good understanding of what any of that meant. So for me starting, it was more of, well, okay, this is what I need to do to keep this job, so I'll do it. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it should be a consideration for people looking to get into academic libraries um, to decide whether that's something you're interested in, whether you're interested in doing the research and publishing and service and things that are necessary to keep up in a tenure track position um, or whether you're more interested in, you know, a position maybe at a different kind of college where you can focus just on being a librarian. And I think that will just be dependent on your kind of your interests. <laughs> okay. And Joy has a question. Joy says, hi, Erin, congrats on becoming a professor. For someone who is interested in research and starting out as a research assistant, what advice can you give in terms of building skills necessary to excel in the job? Um, so I think I've, I've, I've kind of expressed the same idea talking about instruction, but even talking about research, I would say focus on processes before tools. So, you know, you may be working with a faculty member who's pushing you to like, oh, go do your data analysis in SPSS or some particular um, piece of software. Those are great, but they can have a big learning curve. And if you're still learning the process of collecting and analyzing data. I think it's better to focus on the process, even if that means using simpler tools that are more comfortable for you. So if Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets is a space where you're comfortable working, just stick with that first before you get into some of the more complicated statistical tools um, so that you can focus on the process. Um, the, the other piece of advice I would give is Again, kind of like instruction. So sort of like we plan before we search to think about what our search terms are going to be and how they relate. We really want to put as much effort as possible into planning our data collection before we start. So have a really good understanding of every piece of information you're going to be collecting in a data set, um, why you need it, how it's going to be formatted, you know, understanding what units you're going to use. If you have a date in your data, understand how that date's going to be formatted. And the more that you can plan that up front, your data collection will be so much smoother and all the data you have in your research will be more consistent and more accurate. And that makes the entire rest of the process that comes after that work better if you've ensured that consistency up front. Okay, nice. Um, and then we have another question for those interested in data science. Can you tell us whether data visualization plays a part in your career field and research support? 
Definitely. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it really does. I mean, on my campus, we're still, I feel like our faculty are still developing in some areas of what they're doing with their research, what kind of support they're looking for. So I haven't necessarily been called upon much yet to, to help with data visualization, but I do think it's an absolutely essential piece of working with data. Um, I've at least tried to put together like a lib guide on learning how to do good data visualization. And I definitely know that some campuses with more robust research support services definitely do find that as one of their roles. Um, how we visually present data has such an impact on how other people read and understand that data that we have to be sure we're presenting it in ways that are not only clear and comprehensible, but also um, ethical and making sure we're representing the data fairly and not not causing it to seem um, manipulative with the visualization. So yeah, I think that's a really important area to, to study if you wanna be doing data science. I believe the University of North Texas libraries just hired their first kind of data, I don't remember the title, but data science-y type librarian uh, right. to, to help with these kind of data services. Yeah. So. Very cool. It's definitely an emerging area and a lot of academic libraries to, to have those specific um, data services. Yes, exactly. Um, and we actually have a day of data science coming up uh, on March 22nd, where we are inviting students to do poster sessions and also faculty to do lightning talks and industry experts, because it is just such a growing field. Yeah. Oh, and thank you for putting the link in the chat. Excellent. I believe there was one more question. Um, I'll go ahead and it was sent to me in a Teams chat. So I'll go ahead and read it out now. Um, do you, can you speak to the state's influence? Oh, here it comes. <laughs> Recently, it seems the state has become more involved in university policies. How might state policies like book bans or uh, other types of bans impact the future roles of librarians? You know, that is such a good question. It's definitely something that is, on our minds a lot, um, you know. Just this, just recently, within the past couple of months, we had the TikTok ban at the state of Texas level, and we were told, yes. "Okay, you can't use TikTok anymore." Well, that impacts our social media marketing strategy for the library and thinking through how we reach students to let them know about our services. Um, the book ban kinds of questions haven't necessarily touched us at the academic level yet. I think we're quite a bit more protected than the public and school libraries, but um, but if you've already got a government that's feeling like they're very comfortable reaching into these issues, um, you know, I, I I look at Florida and Governor DeSantis becoming much more aggressive about mandating certain things in universities, mandating or or restricting things in universities. It's not hard to imagine that that could be true in Texas as well. Um, I think it's really important that that we stay uh, cognizant of what's happening in the news, that we be prepared to address things proactively if it seems like it's moving that direction, and that we all be well-versed in understanding the arguments for why academic libraries need to have certain materials on hand, what the research and academic value is, um, that we understand what those what those needs are and what our responsibilities are um, to help push back as much as we can. Yeah, exactly. I think that knowledge is power, right? If you if you don't know what's going on and you're not ready to talk about it, then you're not going to be able to step up when the time comes. Yeah. And I also, I just as an aside, I would also say, I think it's important for librarians of any stripe, whether you're academic school, public, um, to be aware of what's happening in other libraries around you and to kind of be standing up for each other. So our, you know, our Sam Houston library hasn't really faced any issues yet, but our public library here in Huntsville has faced a lot of um, issues with challenges to certain kinds of books and um, rather heated hours long debates at city council sessions and whatnot. And I think it's, um, it's been important for our academic librarians to come in just as citizens and be able to share their expertise as well to support our public librarian peers. That's great to hear that you all are doing that. I hope that's happening everywhere. Um, and then I see um, 
Sandy put in the chat that uh, a link for contacting, for looking at your guides yes, so, yes. and also contacting you. Yep. So we're coming up at the top of the hour. And um, if there, if anyone has one last question you want to drop in the chat, go ahead and get that done. I see that you're getting a thank you for the advice from Gabriel and we appreciate your thanks, Gabriel. I feel like this has been a great opportunity for our students to hear the kind of information that's really important to them when they start getting out there to job hunt and as they make their decisions about what they're gonna do for their futures. So we appreciate you and thank you so much, Erin. Sure, well, thank you for having me. I've had so much fun talking to y'all.